you, in your opinion, with this property, Casper, or this 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 showing at Casper, do you think it would stand on its own as its own flagship asset in a different company? Yeah, certainly, I think so. It's uh, I mean, uh, who, who wouldn't want a high grade gold system in the middle of the Golden Triangle? Yeah. Uh, absolutely, be an exciting prospect. One kilometer away from a road. Yeah, yeah, road access, high grade gold system power. That uh, that pretty much would. Power, like, yeah. yeah, I think that would hit almost everyone's checklist for uh, exploring in the nickel they are in, uh, in the Golden Triangle. Welcome and thanks for tuning in. As always, today I sat down with Jeremy Hansen. He's the vice president of exploration and director at Garibaldi Resources. If you've heard of Garibaldi before, you're probably more familiar with their ENL deposit, which is a magmatic nickel copper sulfide deposit. But today I actually talked with Jeremy about one of their other projects, which is their Casper Gold project uh, located on their Palm Springs property, uh, still within the Golden Triangle of BC, but north of the ENL project. The company has recently put out a couple of news releases about initial channel sampling and grab samples. Those results have been positive. They've yielded some uh, very impressive high grades of gold so far. So we talk about those results uh, with Jeremy and what they're looking to do in the future to follow up work on that project. If you like the video, if you find it helpful, we always appreciate you hitting like and subscribe down below. And don't forget to also click the notification button so you can be notified of other content that we put out that will be to your liking. Uh, if you're looking for a certain part of the video that you're interested in more than others, we will be providing timestamps as always. So just scroll down into the description below and click on the timestamp to jump to the area that you're most interested in. So without further ado, enjoy the video. So good morning, Jer. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate your time as always to come on and talk with shareholders. How are things going today so far? Uh, good morning, John. Things are going going well. We're uh, still working away up there and uh, making progress on both the and Casper. That's good. So, I mean, uh, the focus today, this we wanted to uh, direct this discussion at Casper specifically. Um, is obviously there's some exciting news to talk about. The last, you know, Garibaldi has put out the last two weeks some news on Casper, both some grab samples and some channel samples. Um, I guess first of all, as as a VP, you know, you are the v v VP of exploration at Garibaldi. How good does it feel as an exploration geologist? To not only get to work on a you know nickel copper sulfide deposit with gold class grades, but also have the ability to work on a high grade gold deposit as well. Yeah, it's it's really exciting and and really rewarding, and especially in the sense that you know this wasn't an old min file where we were following up. This was a complete grassroots exploration. No one had pounded rocks there before, and uh, you know we'd systematically explored it and and. Uh, uh, made the discovery of the, of this vein, you know, 100% with the Garibaldi team. Nice. And um, let's, for a little bit of context first, maybe again, uh, most of the viewers here will probably be familiar with Garibaldi, but if somebody's sort of newer to the story, they're not so familiar, can you give a little bit of context on where this property is located? Um, yeah, certainly. So this, uh, well, Garibaldi in, in the broad sense is obviously a mineral exploration company uh, with a primary focus in British Columbia. This project itself is in northwestern British Columbia, about uh, 400, 400 kilometers north of Stewart or Terrace in, in what's known as the Golden Triangle. Uh, in the Golden Triangle, there's all kinds of deposits. There's copper, there's gold. We've got a, a magmatic nickel one. Uh, so this, this project that we have, it's called... Uh, this target that we're going after is the Casper target, which is overall part of our ENL Palm Springs project claim block. So it is, uh, if you're familiar with any of the other areas or projects there, uh, there's SK Creek mine. We are about 20 kilometers west of SK, yes, old past producing SK Creek mine. Uh, we are south of uh, the Red Chris Porphyry deposit mine, uh, east of, uh, uh, of the old past producing SNP mine and north of uh, uh, north of Bruce Jack and KSM, so obviously a phenomenal uh, place to be looking for gold. Mm -hmm. And Wes, can you bring up the map? Let's let's throw the map up so everybody can see it. Uh, the the zoomed out one. So, Jerry, if you can just walk us through this, 
the arrow was pointing to the Casper location, correct? Yes, that's correct. So the okay. yeah, Casper is is this uh, golden in quartz vein system that's in the north part of our of our claim block, and it's uh, you can see a road there to to the north and to the west. So we're less than a thousand meters to that to that road, uh, and that road is there to service the uh, Altagas uh, hydroelectric facility. So we're you know for infrastructure you couldn't really get any better in the Golden Triangle being less than a kilometer from a from a road and two kilometers from a hydroelectric facility at a you know a valley bottom as opposed to a mountain top. Um, some other markers for that. So the the nickel mountain uh, E and L system, the magmatic nickel copper system, that's the the southern end of that. And uh, our camp uh, would be located uh, in that uh, that Big green valley that's uh, that's trending down to the uh, you know north northwest to southeast. That's where our camp is. Uh, so there's road access to you know within a thousand meters of Casper. There's road access to our camp, uh, and then you can see the mountains that we explore down to the southwest. And the terrain looks pretty favorable as as well there, right? You're not dealing with mountains there. That looks you know relatively no exactly yeah the like the the valley bottom there is about you know 200 meters above sea level and. And uh, the Casper vein itself is only at uh, about 420 meters above sea level. So we, you know, we we hike in there from the road, um, hike in, hike out quite a bit. So yeah, I mean, uh, it takes about uh, you know, it's a nice, I don't know, 30, 40 minute hike uh, to get in from the road there. So I mean, logistically to to work this is uh, is a you know a hell of a lot easier than working some of these other you know systems and projects that are up at uh, you know 2,000 meters. Right. And for context, uh, the hydroelectric facility that you're talking about, that's the facility you can see on that map directly north, correct? Yes, that's correct. So that's where their their main camp is. Uh, you can see it there. Uh, so there they, that's the Coast Mountain Altagas uh, hydroelectric facility. And they produce, I think, 195 megawatts. So quite a bit of electricity. And then you can see right there where uh, from the actual vein to that, to that, uh, that location, it's like 1.6 kilometers, so we can, you know, look right down into that uh, into that camp and, um, you know, be in that that close to a facility. Right. So water, or sorry, power, uh, very close, and road access very close on on fairly favorable terrain. Nice, yes. like two nice things to have, obviously, when you're looking at developing a property. Yeah, those are huge bonuses to have up in yeah. northwestern BC. Okay, so let's let's talk about the results a bit. Uh, you know, your last two news releases you put out first some grab samples and then um, some channel samples uh, earlier this week. Um, some really nice grades, I believe, as high as almost 250 grams per ton. So let's talk about that, and and maybe for those that aren't familiar, you could describe a little bit the difference between the grab samples and the channel samples, and what should be noted there. Yeah, certainly. So the the first news release we put out a couple of weeks ago that didn't that didn't have any of the channel samples. There was just just grab samples and kind of an update on on what we've been doing. So we had yeah a sample that returned up to two hundred and forty nine grams per ton gold. Uh, we had uh, you know some other ones seventy six point nine grams, and we had one from last year that was one hundred and forty four grams. Those are what what are termed select grab samples, as in the sense you know the geologist is going to smash it open with a rock and he can, you know, make a decision of what he's, what he's choosing. And obviously as geologists, you know, generally, generally see if there's something shiny, of course, we're going to sample it. Right. Uh, the, the channel samples, those are more unbiased in the sense that, so we cut those perpendicular to the vein every meter. Um, so it, 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 you know, using a measuring stick. So it wasn't like, Hey, let's take the, this looks good. Let's take it here. It was, this is where the, the samples are going to lie. So that's, the main difference between a select grab sample and a channel sample and, and how we get a channel sample is we use a, a cutoff saw with a 14 inch diamond blade and essentially make make two cuts about 10 centimeters apart and those, those are about 10 centimeters deep and then you take a hammer and a chisel and smash out that that rock in between the two cuts and sample it okay so yeah that's an, obviously a much more unbiased because you're not being picky and choosy it's just a systematic approach to analyze the vein along the strike length yeah, that's true, and, and it includes some of the wall rock as well. So it's not just a, uh, okay. not just the vein. So the width across the vein that you would be sampling is that about a meter as well? On average, it's it's about a meter. The vein the vein gets up to a meter and a half. Um, it pinches and swells. You know, it can go down to half a meter and back up to a meter and a half. Okay, so on average, what would you say the width of the vein is? I'd say it's about uh, about a meter wide. Okay. 
And Wes, can you bring up the, the first map there? Because it's not, it's really not just one vein we're looking at because you have uh, discovered a few different veins. Yes. Uh, some possible veins that are splaying off the main vein. Yeah. So yeah, so what we're seeing, obviously we have the main vein trending uh, northwest, southeast, and then we have a few other uh, smaller veins that are exposed to some degree. Uh, you've had some nice high grade grab samples off those as well. Um, so this looks like a vein system, correct, Jared? Not one single vein. Yes, that, yes, that's correct. So we, yeah, the the initial vein there that you can see that 120 meter vein exposure. So that's what we, you know, our primary kind of focus and, and work was on was on uncovering that. And much of that was done, you know, by hand. Uh, and as we're exploring out there, you know, we're finding finding additional veins. So earlier. Mid mid the summer at location A, <clears throat> we found another mineralized quartz vein there with with visible gold, uh, and then as you head to the northwest, we found another one, another vein uh, up to even further to the northwest along Strike. Uh, we seen a vein to the southwest that you can see just um, to the left of where that uh, that inset box is, as well as in the creek, there's uh, another vein um, there that, that's uh, mineralized, and you can see they're not all at the same. Uh, you know, strike length or not strike, they're all at the same orientation, not at the same strike. So it's most likely it is right. a vein system and these, these, you know, are probably going to connect uh, and, and they'll have splays coming off of them. So it's, yeah, it's not just one vein. We're finding multiple veins and, uh, you know, quite confident that we're going to be able to keep turning more up. Right. And your ex, is it, would it be your expectation that these veins would sort of fall back and intersect that main vein at some point? Like they it, look like they're pointing towards the main vein. Yeah, it certainly is a is, is absolutely a reasonable uh, you know hypothesis hypothesis to test, and that that would be one of the locations that uh, most geologists would search for. Uh, you know, really high grade zones is where you have two veins that are going to come come together, uh, and and where they come together, that's often where uh, you get uh, some of the most gold deposited in these types of systems. Okay, and would would you are you looking actively, or would you expect to possibly find more of these splays coming off the main vein? Yeah, we're we're actively looking. So the as you can see there in that image, it's you know all trees. Uh, there's lots of, of vegetation and uh, dirt and and moss. So it's not just as easy as you know walking across and looking at all the rock. You gotta um, our our process is you know really detailed soil samples. Uh, and then when we see an anomaly, whether that's a spike in gold or silver or copper or lead, then we generally have to go in there and, and un pull all the moss away, the dirt, uh, and, and try to determine what's causing that anomaly. Most of the time, if, if there's a nice discrete anomaly, it, it's another quartz vein, and that's kind of how we've been exploring this. Okay. So how much how much sort of material and overburden did you have to pull off to expose these other smaller veins? Like this? It, it ranges from... You know, if you're in, an, uh, in, a, in a creek, quite often there's some rocks poking out uh, and you don't really have to pull anything off. But if you're not in those creeks and the creeks are spaced, you know, every couple hundred meters. So by far, the majority of the ground is covered in, I would say, at least a foot or two of moss and dirt. So it's not, uh, you know, you don't need to get a giant excavator in there and dig all these test pits. You just got to take, you know, 10, 15 minutes with you and your partner and, you know, bust out the shovel and pickaxe and, uh, and dig down to bedrock. And we also use... Um, uh, what's called a can dig, which is a you know really mini, really extra mini excavator that can be moved with the helicopter, and, and it can dig down to uh, you know probably eight or ten feet. So that's that's probably that's the tool that we're primarily using in the the cut block there along the the 120 meter vein exposure is this uh, right um, you know little mini mini excavator. Okay, and in terms of width, these these smaller veins that you found are they comparable width to the main one, or slightly smaller, or what are we looking at? They're they're they are slightly smaller. They're in that you know thirty to fifty centimeter range. Okay. Um, to yeah, they're they're decent veins, um, but they do have lots of uh, sulfides and, and obviously visible gold in them. Okay, so I mean you've already mentioned it, but let might as well talk about it now. So in terms of of uh, finding more of these and and sort of increasing the strike length. You've talked about the, the geochemical soil sampling. Let's talk about that. So on this map, we can see a bunch of soil samples. For example, sort of to the far east or southeast, you have quite a few like more elevated samples. And then I believe in the last press release, you had put out that you found samples as high as 500 
uh, parts per billion. Is that just so for clarity for everyone, is that the same type of soil sample? Are we comparing apples to apples or is that a different type of uh, those, sampling method? Those would be, no, that would be comparing apples to oranges there. So in the, the first map that we put out, those are NMI samples, which is mobile metal ion. So in, in that type of geochemical survey, you're, you're not actually analyzing the, the soil particles, you're analyzing the ions that are attached to the soil particles. And so that, that particular right. survey that we did, um, it started at the main vein and then headed east. Uh, so there was no MMI survey to the west of the vein when we did this. So you, the reason we put the, the MMI samples on there is because they clearly show that anomaly down to the, to the southeast. And so what we've also, another type of common soil sample, probably the most common that uh, most exploration geologists utilize is the, just the classic B horizon soil sample. That's where you're, you're analyzing the actual broken, the soil particles themselves. Uh, and you're, you know, hoping that's coming from broken down rock uh, that, that's sitting below it. And so those, those samples that, uh, that we've been taking all year and continue to take them uh, have shown an anomaly to about 150 meters to the Northwest directly along strike. Uh, of the main vein there, so we've got crews actively out there right now uncovering uh, uncovering what those uh, what's what's causing those samples to spike. And yeah, though those were consistent. Like there was a 500 ppb, uh, I think a 50, 100, 150, then another 495 ppb evenly spaced along strike. So it's certainly a you know a real valid anomaly that we're following up. Okay. And is there any particular reason why you switch the the sampling methodology to the B horizon to the northwest? Um, so they they both work. the The B horizon is certainly a much more efficient uh, technique. Uh, you could you know, in the time it takes to get one NMI sample, you could probably get three or four or, uh, regular B horizon samples. The the NMI one because you're analyzing the the ions and it's such a low detection limit. You can see there it's down all the way to to point one ppb. Like right. you can't use anything metal. You can't you everything's got to be done with plastic and plastic sho shovels and plastic trowels and plastic bags and it's a, it's a lot more complicated so did the b-horizon soils work then we're going to continue to use those it's just a faster and more efficient uh, way to explore okay and so basically the the soil sampling because you're you're dealing with a lot of moss and tree cover here that is basically you're using that as your sort of your vectoring tool that if you're getting these good results then you can spend the money to sort of and do the work to excavate that area looking for you know the extension of the vein would that be correct yeah absolutely that's yeah that's our, our primary way of exploring out there okay so the highest priority follow-up areas would be just basically northwest and then i guess to the southeast as well based on the, the soil sampling yeah that's correct so the yeah certainly to the northwest where we've got those uh for B horizon soil samples a lot directly along strike and then to the east there. So that's those NMI samples are coming in in a spot where we've uncovered some outcrop where we have this silicified volcanic unit, um, most likely a rhyolite, uh, and that's got up to 4.2 grams per ton gold in it. And so that uh, that is, you know, most likely related to this gold vein system. If we've got a big volcanic unit that's heavily silicified, which is uh, you know, the silicification, that's the type of quartz alteration uh, over there, and it's completely flooded throughout the rock and has gold in it. Then as we move to the west, that uh, that that silicification then gets narrowed down into these veins, uh, into what we call quartz veins. Okay, so yeah, your expectation would be that these two things are related. They're coming from essentially the same ultimate source underground. Um, so to the southeast, this silicified rhyolite, then would you would this this would be more of like a bulk tonnage target then if it's not in a vein format? Is yeah, that... that that yeah. So it's certainly a reasonable hypothesis to say that uh, this you know silicified volcanic unit with gold in it is related to these gold veins just a couple hundred meters to the west. So if yeah, right. if we if we were to find you know a a volcanic unit that uh, you know with any reasonable strike length and thickness that's running a couple grams gold, then that uh, you know that's another incredibly uh, prospective target. Okay. And that area is under the same forest cover as like, this is yeah. all heavily yeah. forested, right? Yeah, yeah. Big hemlock trees. So it's, it's nice to walk through when the devil's club is, is, uh, is dead, uh, yeah. you know, evenly spaced hemlocks and, uh, lots of moss. So it's not too hard on the boots. Okay. So let's, let's talk strike length here. So, um, 
just sort of zoom, and we are in the zoomed out image, but so the, the zoomed in results that you did on the channel, I think that was over about 120 meters or 130. Um, what, what, what do you sort of project based on what you know now, what do you sort of figure for the total strike length of the system that you're dealing with, taking into account maybe the, the displays as well that you have? Yeah, I think it, it it's going to be probably about uh, at least 400 meters. I would I would say so. We've you know definitively uncovered 120 or at the time of this news release it was 120 meters. We've got it to about 130 meters now, where you can walk the whole way and put your finger on the vein. Okay. The those soil anomalies to the northwest along Strike that's another 150 meters uh, to the northwest, uh, as well as in the creek there and. Uh, the creek is heading down to the southwest, but we also do suspect that it may continue across the creek um, to the southeast. It just may have been uh, juxtaposed a bit along the fall. So if you were to add up all that that vein strike length and and then uh, you know all the veins that are coming off at the those two to two or two or three to to the north and the one to the south, I think you'd easily get about four hundred meters. Okay, so I mean that's that's a decent length uh, to start, and that's all open essentially along strike, right? Or Correct me if I'm yeah. wrong. You haven't you haven't cut it off yet, like the to the extent that you've done soil sampling or to the extent that you've uncovered things, nothing has been cut off so far. There's still no, we're still rate. very very early stage uh, exploration here, so we're okay. Um, yeah, continuing to uncover it. So let's talk, I guess, the go forward plan. So you have this information today in West. Maybe zoom. Let's bring up the second map or the second uh, yeah the zoomed in map for a second of the vein itself here we go so this is this is just the zoomed in and you know this is part of the results that you put out um this week here so yep. this is just showing this the channel samples that you did along this is the exposed part of the vein right this isn't the yeah that's correct so this is just zoomed in on that uh, that 120 meter exposure uh, okay. So you can see, you can see that down in the bottom right to the southeast, that's where that 249 gram per ton sample came from. And the yeah. furthest southeast channel sample returned 93 grams gold. So, you know, that's an example of that was just as far as we had got assays or work work done at the time when we put this news release out. So we've continued to expand that down to the southeast. So that's been our, you know, one of our highest priorities here just on that immediate vein exposure is continuing to expand it to the southeast. Okay. As well. Okay. Oh, go on. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Jer. So I was just going to say as well. You can kind of see hidden in the trees the the another. That's one of the quartz vein back up there. The second one that uh, that had visible gold in it. So we're continuing to to expand that as well and then un uncover it and trench it out. Okay. And I, I think this will be a natural question for some people to ask. So you have fairly continuous grades over most of the vein, and then there's a certain area as you're moving to the south east that it's sort of, is it pinching off there or are you not getting anything in there or what's happening so, between the samples where you seem to have good grades and then it sort of drops off and then we're back to the high grades towards the far southeast yeah certainly so the the vein itself does does pinch and swell like i said it gets up to over a meter and a half and then down into you know less than you know about 40 50 centimeters so as it gets narrower um there, there's a couple factors there that that may be in you know leading to some lower grades there that uh, the one is just when we sampled that vein it had a hole it was thinner there and it had a whole lot of uh, wall rock in it so it would have diluted any any mineralization that was in the vein as well as it's you know fairly reasonable to say that where where these veins pinch uh, and get uh, squeezed a bit more uh, often there those higher pressure zones is, is you'll find less gold uh, as opposed to the the wider, thicker zones uh, where the pressure would be lower, allowing gold to precipitate out. Okay, so we're we're sort of talking about the genesis of how this would form. So, thinking in terms of you know the wider the channel that the gold can fit through, that would produce lower pressures. And if you have a gold bearing fluid and the gold is precipitating out, that's happening under a pressure drop. Then obviously, the wider it is, the easier it is for it to precipitate out under a drop of pressure. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly correct. And that's also the same reason why we also look for where multiple veins connect to each other, because at those apexes, that's the lowest point to, uh, of pressure and often some of the highest grade stuff. Okay, so yeah, let's let's talk. Uh, let's talk uh, future work here. Uh, in the news release, you do mention that you'll be drilling that this fall. 
So what do you have planned uh, so far for follow-up work in terms of, you know, geochem sampling, you know, trench sampling, um, drilling, like let, walk us through that. Certainly. So as, as we're moving into the fall here, the, you know, one of the bonuses here is that we can work this uh, well into the fall and, and into the winter. So our, our focus will continue to be uncovering the, the main vein there down to the southeast, following up the, on the various soil anomalies and geophysical anomalies and, and other veins that are showing up. And as we want to, to drill this, one of our first things that, that we need to understand is the, is the dip of this. We know the strike is obviously uh, to the northwest and down to the southeast, but um, you know, we, we've at surface we can only see the strike or the, the dip of it for you know a, a foot or so. So the, one of the first things we want to do is is drill a hole, you know, hopefully intercepting maybe 10, 15, 20 meters below surface underneath the the vein to figure out is it dipping down to the southwest, which is the way we believe it is. Um, so that's the first thing we need to figure out is which way it's it's uh, dipping, and then we'll be able to to test it as we go further. Uh, deeper in, into the earth and, and as well as a long strike. Okay, so how many holes do you think you would you would get on sort of this initial, um, like call it phase one diamond drilling? Yeah, the the I think uh, probably four to six holes would be reasonable. I mean, they're not they're going to be probably in that hundred to one hundred twenty five, maybe one hundred fifty meter depths. So we certainly want to uh, you know intercept uh, the first hole that uh, that I would do, and I think most people would probably pick would be drilling underneath the the main vein towards that second vein that carries VG. Um, so that, that's right. most likely would be our first hole. Uh, and then probably steepen the drill up a bit so you can get another intercept a little deeper. Uh, and then we'll most likely go down to the southeast there and test that uh, that second part of the vein that's that's got those really exceptional grades. Okay. So how deep do you think you would get on this first pass just to test the depth? Like, are we talking like 100 meters? Are we talking 50 meters? The 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 drill holes themselves will probably be about 100 100 to 150 meters deep. So the the actual intercept below, uh, you know, below the the top of the vein would be roughly let's say 20 meters below surface, and then we'll we'll steepen the drill and get 50 meters below. Uh, you can just continue to to steepen up the drill from the same pad and, and continue to track it down. Okay, and you mentioned it already, but let's elaborate on it a bit in terms of you know how often or when you could work on this project. What what's the sort of season, you know, what's the range look like for when you can actually drill this project and do work on it? Um, yeah, it's certainly, I would say you know probably at least till you know till Christmas, maybe even in January if if uh, you know we really wanted to to keep going at it to, into the winter. It's like I said, it's only at 420 meters above sea level. So even even if there's a couple feet of snow, a guy could still be drilling there. Uh, there's no avalanche risk there. There, as long as there's water, uh, which there, there's two creeks on. There's a creek on either side of this, so those, those creeks are probably going to flow into into January at those lower elevations. Uh, so as long as you do that water, you could work it and drill it. And so probably you could work it all the way into I would say at least into late December, and, uh, and those creeks would be flowing again probably in April. Okay, so that's that's a pretty wide window of work. So that, I I guess a nice change from Nickel Mountain, where you're obviously so limited in you know how much of the year you get to work up there. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, and I I guess this you know having a project like this lets at least when say things aren't favorable at Nickel Mountain or it's not the right season, you can put some work into here, building value for the company, chasing a high grade gold asset. Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's been a you know the, this year in northwestern BC has I think probably been the wettest I've ever seen, um, and uh, you know for a lot of the old timers will say it's one of the wettest years that uh, that they've ever experienced. So it's been you know a, yeah a really good bonus when we have you know we don't really have many standby days nowadays because uh, if we can't fly to Nickel Mountain then the crews go to uh, go to Casper and get to work out there. Okay, well that's good. Like I think that's good good for people to hear that at least it, it's like efficient use of people's time that you're putting, you know, your resources to, to good use, no matter what is happening kind of thing. Um, I know in the news release, I think it was mentioned that uh, there, there's a few sulfides, uh, calcopyrite and galena, so, you know, copper lead. Uh, arsenic was mentioned as well. Is there a, a, a 
big association between sort of the higher grades of gold and the arsenic or is it weak? No, the, the, the gold is most strongly correlated with, with lead and copper, which would be okay. uh, calcopyrite and galena. Those are the, the sulfides. There is a little bit of arsenopyrite there, but uh, our correlation matrices are showing that uh, the gold is not, not primarily focused with arsenic and that it's, it's with the lead and the copper. And we've done also some scanning electron microprobe work, and we can see that uh, these gold grains are, are hanging out uh, at the boundaries of the, the galena and calcopyrite sulfide grains. Okay, so that's a good thing, right? You're yeah, that's want... yeah, certainly. You don't want your. I mean, it's 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 not the end of the world if uh, if your gold is with arsenic, but uh, if it's not with arsenic or not with mercury or, or some deleterious element like that, then that's always a bonus. Preferable. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm going to throw out a, a question to you. In your opinion, with this property, Casper, or this 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 showing at Casper, do you think it would stand on its own as its own flagship asset in a different company? Yeah, certainly. I think so. It's, uh, I mean, uh, who, who wouldn't want a high grade gold system in the middle of the Golden Triangle? Yeah. Um, absolutely. An exciting prospect. One kilometer away from a road. Yeah. Yeah. Road access, high grade gold system power. That, uh, that pretty much would. One from power. Like, yeah. yeah. I think that would hit almost everyone's checklist for uh, exploring in the nickel or in the, in the Golden Triangle. Okay. And uh, in the news release, I, d I believe you did mention some geophysics, uh, some IP survey that had been done in the area. It did identify a resistivity low, which would be, obvious, I guess, a, a conductivity high. Yeah. Um, that is a potential follow-up target for you as well. And when was that survey done? And do you expect to do any follow-up geophysics in the area? So that, that, that survey was in? actually... It's so uh, I'll answer the so yes, we're doing what's called physical properties testing right now is where where we've taken uh, about there's a number of different lithologies out there. There's that volcanic unit, there's uh, that or the volcanic rhyolite, there's a siltstone, there's the quartz vein itself, um, uh, and there's another volcanic unit. So what we've done is we've got a good population of about 20 samples of each of those lithologies, uh, and then we get them tested for physical parameters to see if there's any. If there's a big difference in the chargeability of the, the the material we're going after, so that's that's done in the process, or that's being done right now to see how we can best utilize the geophysical survey. We did the IP survey actually a, a couple of of years ago. So the way um, I'll give a quick story here of how Casper came to be. So there was an old aerodat uh, resistivity survey that was flown in in the 90s that was never followed up on, and it just had this little anomaly that happened to look like Casper the ghost. So we went in and uh, <laughs> and uh, and and we're just chipping away at, at that. And on our we didn't find anything at that anomaly, but on the way out, just by smashing every every rock that we see, we come across this quartz vein. Obviously, it's got sulfides in it. You sample it, comes back. Like, I think that one came back 40 grams gold. Uh, so then we went back later in the year, took a whole bunch more samples. We got up to 60 or 70 grams gold. Came back the following season, uh, did a bunch of hand trenching. Uh, that was in 2018. Uh, hand trenched it out, took some some samples. We got up to about 144 grams. Uh, and then last year, we did uh, the backpack drilling. Which was about a little Shaw backpack drill and, and tested those. And we, I know we, we put those out in February. Unfortunately, I think we put them out on the, the worst day of the market uh, uh, that we had in the spring here. And then so this year, yeah, yeah so I don't think it uh, didn't, uh, yeah, that was about the worst time you could have. And then so, yeah, this year, then we, we did all the clear cutting this year and, and really got the, the can dig in there and then trenched it and exposed it. So it's been a bit of a, uh, you know, a process to make sure that this is this is real before we go bring it to the market. We're not just going to go, you know, go wave every mineralized sample that uh, we come across. Yeah. Well, I mean, it certainly looks very prospective, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, what the diamond drilling has to say. I mean, obviously, the ch channel samples and the grab samples are a great start. Yeah. And, I mean, that has to have you excited. I, I think it has a lot of shareholders excited. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know. Gold tends to be in favor right now. I mean, gold is, happens to be worth a lot. So, having a, a secondary asset like uh, Casper, hey, that's that's a good thing. We'll take it, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. From the geophysics standpoint, just uh, maybe to clarify for people, when you're going after the the resistivity low, which would be a conductivity high, the theory there would be, you know, uh, projecting more sulfides than. Um, yeah, 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 absolutely. So if there's something there that can 
you know, allow a little bit of current to go through it or, or, or be chargeable, uh, then you're going to go there and, and see what that is. And, you know, that could be sulfides, that could be, it could be graphite, it could be a fault with a whole bunch of yeah. fault gouge in it. So, I mean, another thing that we've, we've found out here is also these, there's, in the sedimentary package out there, these sulfide layers, uh, you know, massive, massive pyrite that are, have about a half a gram, made up to a gram of gold in them. So those also could be related to this, this overall system where you've got, you know, layered sulfides with gold in it. You've got uh, silicification that's in a vault, in a rhyolite that's uh, running gold. And obviously you've got this gold vein, very high grade gold. So it's, you know, all these, all these, when you put all this stuff together, it's looking very exciting. Yeah. There's a lot of clues here, right. That tell you you're onto something. Um, yeah. The the resistivity low is that relatively on strike of what you know the approximate guess to the projection of the. It's a bit to the it's a bit to the south, so it's okay. it's not directly on strike, but it is it's, it's only a, uh, a couple or two hundred meters down to the south. Okay. Well, I mean, I think that covers it. I think this has been just a good uh, you know a good quick analysis of the news. I mean, there's a lot to be excited about. Uh, yeah, very certainly. high gold grades. We're in a, uh, a positive gold market. Um, there was one, I think one of the veins displays, have you done assays on that one? I think it was the one to the Southwest. That one doesn't have any, it's identified on the map, but it didn't. Have yeah. The one to yet. the, to the North. No, we haven't got those back yet. Okay, where so it's that's a new kind of pending as well, yet. right? Yeah. So, so everyone can kind of look forward to that. And then obviously the, the diamond drilling, um, you know, whenever you'll be able to get in and do that, that's cool. going to be exciting to, you know, to see what you get. Yeah, certainly. Okay. Well, appreciate as always, Jared, taking the time to speak with shareholders, give us an update. And uh, I'm sure we'll have you back in, uh, in the not too distant future to, to talk about results of um, one way or the other, well, whether it's, you know, more nickel mountain results or whether it's, uh, you know, more work at Casper, you know, we'll have you back in and, and discussing that. So thanks again for your time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, John. Okay. Cheers.